Thank you, uh, Mataji. And thanks to Swami Sarvapri Anandaji for a beautiful uh, 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 talk. In fact, I want to start on something that uh, he was talking about in his uh, uh, question and answer session because it's so important uh, in tune, um, I'm sure, with what he was saying. Uh, and then I'll come, uh, come back to Queen Madalasa's uh, lullaby. And that is, he was talking about uh, practice in Advaita Vedanta and how the, uh, the essence of Advaita Vedanta is knowing who we are, knowing the truth, which means in Advaita Vedanta, knowing who we are, because the truth is about who we are. Um, and uh, I just wanted to emphasize uh, something that he uh, indicated when he talked about how uh, we have to hold on to the truth and to, uh, as Swami Vivekananda says, as the Swami Sarvapriyananda quoted, that to hold on to it until it tingles in every drop of our blood. Uh, Swami Vivekananda once said, well, let me back up for a moment and, and say that the reason I want to elaborate on this point is that the topic is uh, the experience of oneness and uh, uh, integrating Advaita Vedanta into our lives and experience. Swami Vivekananda once said that I shall compare, Swamiji, in Swamiji's words, uh, paraphrased, I shall compare truth to a corrosive substance which will burn its way through whatever it falls upon, through uh, uh, hard materials more slowly, through soft materials quicker, but burn its way through it will. And that I can say uh, from my limited uh, life and experience that that is true. If we take up these ideas, as Swami Sarvapriyananda was saying, if we really understand them, and if we don't uh, live constantly contrary to them, but if we understand, uh, understand these uh, ideas, understand them well, and try to, the best we can, try to live up to them, then we find in time that they begin to take over. They begin, uh, as Swamiji said, to burn through our own ignorance. They begin to become part of the way that we think. And according to Vedanta, and this is an interpolation, it's not that Vedanta says this somewhere, but it's, uh, uh, it's implied in all of Vedanta, that the whole universe is a universe of habit. And we see the way we see. We see unreality rather than reality only because of habits. And habits of what? Habits of thought. And habits of thought which have become translated through their uh, uh, strength as habits into habits of perception. So we see the world that we see because of habitual ways of thoughts that have become so concretized that they become habits of perception. That doesn't mean that I can change, uh, change my habits of thought and see the sun as blue rather than as uh, white or yellowish white. It doesn't mean anything superficial or silly like that. It does mean that if I'm convinced of a truth, and it is a truth, a truth that great sages have realized and confirmed over the ages in experience. If I understand it, yes, understand it even with the mind and the intellect, and I hold on to it, uh, reaffirm it until it, uh, I begin to see the truth of it, not in full blaze of a realization or a super sensuous experience, but I begin to feel the truth of it. It begins to uh, appeal to me as, yes, I know this is true. I don't see it, but I know this is true. Then our very perception begins to change. The way that we see the world begins to change. The way that we see ourselves begins to change. Yes, what we seek is a comprehensively and finally transformative uh, realization of the truth. That's what we seek. But what we can get now before that, uh, well, uh, we may be ready for that. Once we understand these truths and hold on to them, it begins to change the way that we think. It begins to become a part of our perception. The world itself looks different. We feel different about ourselves as well. 
And so that, these ideas are powers. They're not passive ideas. I can study physics. I can study Swahili. I can study Chinese and so forth and uh, uh, learn a great deal, learn to express myself in different languages, learn the principles of different sciences and so forth. Uh, but those are not transformative ideas. Yes, I can use them in my work and I can use them in conversation and so forth, but they're not transformative. But the thing about spiritual truth is that the truths are transformative because they are based on what is true even now when we don't see it. It is the truth of our existence right now, though we don't experience it. But something within us has never forgotten that. And as those ideas go deep within, we begin first to feel them. We begin to get a grasp of them. And by feel them, I don't mean with the senses. I don't mean <laughs> touching them with the fingers or anything like that. And I don't mean anything touchy-feely or anything sentimental. But we begin to get an intuitive grasp of the ideas. That's what Swami Vivekananda says is faith, an intuitive grasp on the ultimate. Those are extremely profound uh, words that help us in our spiritual life. Faith is an intuitive grasp of the ultimate. And so these ideas, as they go deeper, we begin to see how, yes, now I not only intellectually understand, but I can feel that the whole universe rests within my consciousness. I can feel that whereas before I used to think I was inside of the body, I was the body, but somehow inside of it, the mind was inside of it and my consciousness was inside of the mind or something. No, now I see it's the most obvious fact that the body itself is floating within my consciousness. And then not just the body, but the world itself is floating within my consciousness. Uh, and so uh, with, uh, with the various ways of expressing the non-dualistic truth, because there are different ways of expressing it, um, but they all point to the same thing. We begin to get an intuitive grasp of that. We begin to get a sense of it. We begin to feel that, yes, this is true, and I know that it's true. It's just that I haven't had the, the, the veil of ignorance has not yet been broken, but I can feel that it's a veil. I can feel that it's a veil and it can be torn. Uh, I just have to keep working at it uh, to tear it. And so the ideas of Vedanta are powers. They're not a philosophy for scratching the head, not, oh, this is an interesting idea. Oh, that's really cool. I like that idea. Oh, this is cool. That's cool. Uh, but then uh, this other tradition says that, and that's also cool. And this tradition says that, and that's cool. And yeah, everything's cool. And I like it all. And it's a lot of fun to deal with these ideas. And let's go talk about them. No. That's okay. That has its place when we're searching for the truth. That all has its uh, good place. I'm not criticizing that uh, uh, at its proper place. But a time comes when, no, that's not what we want. We don't want cool ideas. We want the truth. We want to know what is true and how is it true and how am I to understand that it's true. And once I begin to understand it intellectually, because it is a truth based on perception, of the reality, not of something made up, not of some idea that some sage thought, I think people should do like this and I think they should not do like that. That's what uh, some of social morality is based on, just what people thought uh, they should like and what they thought people should not like. So there is real morality and then there's conventional morality, which uh, has all kinds of uh, nonsense mixed into it. Uh, but I'm not talking about that. I'm speaking about the uh, truth of reality itself, the present truth. Uh, so uh, never, uh, never think lightly of the power of truth. Swami Vivekananda says, once you have known something to be true, you can never forget it. And that is true. That's the danger in Vedanta. <laughs> Don't enter into the door unless uh, you want that. Because once you uh, understand something is true, you may want to forget it because you want to go back to your old life, uh, or you may think that you want to go back to your old life. You know, nobody really does, but they think that sometimes. Uh, but uh, you never can completely. The, once you've understood a truth, it's never going to let go. So from the positive standpoint, do understand the truth. Do try to grasp these ideas. I try to grasp them until you begin to feel them. Uh, but on the other side, 
which I won't stress too much because I don't really think it should be stressed, but just, uh, just to balance the picture. On the other side, once you do understand it, then you can't go back. Don't think that you can. You can try. You can try. Many people do try. But eventually you find, as Sri Ramakrishna said, that uh, once the cobra has bitten, it won't let you go. Once you've been bitten, then your fate is uh, determined. So understand these things. Understand these truths. Know that they are truths that are meant to be experienced. They're truths which are transformative. Uh, and hold on to them until they become such, because they will. So now, let me come to Madalasa's lullaby. So this first uh, uh, session on Madalasa is supposed to be the story, but the story will take less than five minutes to tell. <laughs> so, so we'll begin the, the, uh, the text also, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, the story comes from the Markandeya Purana, which is one of the oldest, it's generally considered the oldest or one of the oldest Puranas, it's generally considered the oldest. And it's a non-sectarian Purana. There's uh, like the Vishnu Purana and uh, the Shiva Purana and uh, other Puranas dedicated, Agni Purana, Puranas Devi Purana, uh, also known as the Devi Bhagavata. Puranas devoted to particular deities and particular sectarian, they're not highly sectarian, none of the Puranas are, but, the, uh, but they, support a particular sectarian view to some extent. And they, uh, they present a particular deity as the central character and the central reality. But the Markandeya Purana is non-sectarian. Uh, it's very old uh, and many great traditions and many great stories are contained uh, within it. And one of those stories is the story of this great queen Madalasa. Uh, Swami Vivekananda mentions her story uh, it tells about uh, it tells about her uh, in his uh, Thousand Island Park uh, inspired talks, uh, and uh, Swami Ashokananda used to speak of Queen Madalasa also. Uh, so let me tell the basic story and then uh, expand on it a little bit. And let me say first before the basic story that in the Markandeya Purana. Uh, there are uh, some uh, various passages uh, uh, about Queen Madalasa, and uh, I'm not going to go into all of those because uh, they go in various directions, not in bad directions, but one of them has Queen Madalasa giving long lectures on Dharma, which is important, uh, but it's not the subject right now, uh, about Dharma and about uh, political science, how to run a kingdom and so forth, because she was a queen. Uh, so we're not interested in that today. Um, uh, even at best, that part is a, uh, a little boring, valuable, uh, but uh, boring. Uh, but the story is very simple. Forward. So the story is that there was a uh, 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 Madalasa who was married to a young king and she thereby became uh, a queen. She, of course, was uh, from a royal family also, and that has happened in uh, all over the world, including Europe. Uh, marriages in, uh, among the royalty were often, uh, usually, they were arranged in order to uh, cement alliances uh, between uh, different uh, kingdoms and so forth. So she was married to uh, a king, uh, Rita Dwaja. Uh, Rita Dwaja means he who has, carries the flag, the banner, the Dwaja of Ritam, of uh, righteousness, of truth, of Dharma. And uh, so uh, uh, he was a powerful king and married this beautiful uh, young princess. But when he married her, he found that she was a knower of Brahman. Her father had been uh, a, a royal sage. And she was, uh, when she married the, 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 the young king, she was already a knower of uh, uh, Brahman. He saw that she knew that she was a knower of the highest truth. And so he told her that you are a knower of, the, of uh, Brahman, the knower of the highest truth. So I will give the raising of our children to you. As we have children, you will be in charge of raising them, but I want to give them their names. And so this was the deal. I, the king, I give the names and you take care of them, <laughs> you bring them up. And it wasn't because he was abdicating responsibility or because he was a lazy fellow. It was because he realized that as a Nora Brahman, uh, she will be the 
uh, best of uh, caretakers for the children. She will raise them also uh, in uh, the highest wisdom. And so in uh, time, they had uh, children. The first uh, child, the uh, king named Vikranta. Uh, Vikranta means uh, Vikramashir Ashali. Vikramashali, or one who is powerful, one who is very strong. So he was a king and he wanted princes uh, to raise, to uh, take over the kingdom when he was ready to retire with his wife. So he gives him this name of Vikrant, one who is uh, very powerful, very strong, uh, made to be a ruler and a warrior. But Queen Madalasa, because she was an of Brahman, from the time the baby was born, she used to sing to it, Shuddhosi buddhosi niranjanosi. You are pure, you are awakened, uh, you are without any stain. Samsara maya parivarjitosi. You are without any stain of uh, maya. Samsara swapnam tyajamoha nidram. Uh, give up this uh, dream of the world, uh, which is based in the sleep of ignorance. Madala sola, madala sola, Thus, the verse ends, uh, thus would Madalasa sing to her son. So from the time the child was born, she would sing to it, you are pure, you are awakened, you are without any stain. Uh, give up this, uh, 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 um, the delusion of the world. Let me get the because I'm doing it part by part, I get lost in the verse. <laughs> so, samsara maya parivarjitosi, you are free from the, uh, uh, the delusion of this, uh, this world, the maya of this world. Samsara swapnam tyajamoha nidram. Give up tyaja, give up this uh, dream of uh, samsara, this dream of worldly existence, which comes out of moha nidram, which comes from the sleep of ignorance. And thus, the verse ends, would Madalasa sing her lullaby to her son. And so what happened? She would sing this lullaby to her child from its birth. And so the child, when it was old enough to, uh, uh, to perceive and act uh, it, uh, as, as a uh, youth, it left home, gave up the kingdom uh, as an illumined soul. And I went to live the life of a, uh, of a realized soul, free from all worldly taints, as a, one, as a wanderer, with no attachments to anything. And they had a second son, and this one that the king named Subahu, the one of a mighty arm, the mighty armed one. Uh, and so this was his hope, that uh, now we have another son, he will uh, take charge of the kingdom. So Madalasa brought up the child in the same way, singing the same hymn to the child, telling the child that you are the reality itself. You are pure, you are stainless, uh, you are free from the, the maya of this world. So give up this uh, uh, dream of worldly existence, uh, which is founded in the sleep of ignorance. And thus she would sing to her child. And so Subahu also, as the child grew up, uh, it just uh, uh, it was uh, illumined by the teaching of uh, uh, his mother, and it too wandered out of the kingdom, gave up uh, uh, all ties, and lived a life of uh, illumination and perfect non-attachment, um, and of course of no use to the king. <laughs> so, uh, so then they had a, uh, a third son, and the king gave him the name Shatru Taman the one who is the uh, mighty enemy of his foes, the one who destroys, punishes uh, his foes. Uh, and um, uh, so again, this was a name given to one who is going to be a great warrior and a great king and the leader of the kingdom who would smash all enemies. And so again, Madalasa saying the same hymn to this child, taught it uh, its true nature, that you are the pure one, you are awakened, stainless, ever free. Uh, you're not the world and the world is not yours. And so Shatru Dhamman also uh, became the Shatru, the enemy of uh, worldly ignorance and also attained as a youth, attained to perfect liberation and uh, wandered off into uh, oblivion and perfect non-attachment and identity with the highest reality. 
if that sounds like something you don't, don't want, then don't listen any further. <laughs> That's uh, what eventually we find we all want, to realize uh, that highest truth where we're absorbed in the truth. As Swami uh, Sarvapriyananda was saying in the answer to that same question I spoke about at the beginning of this session, uh, that's eventually what we want to get to, where that is the truth, and that's what we see. That is the truth that we see. There's no conflicting thought. There's no conflicting perception. Whether we see the world or don't see the world, it doesn't matter, because we know the truth. And so, Vikranta, uh, Subahu, Shatru uh, Dhaman, all of them were disappointments to their father. Of course, he wanted the welfare of his sons, but like uh, most fathers and most mothers, he thought the welfare of his sons meant uh, uh, at least some worldly uh, success and worldly good. He wanted a son who would take over the kingdom so that he and his wife could retire someday. And just because he thought that, that is a good, that's what all normal people think, <laughs> uh, that uh, it's good to be religious, uh, uh, good to have some religion, have a little faith, uh, go to the church or temple of your choice. Um, uh, it will help you, it'll give you some strength and some moral courage and everything, but not too much, not too much. <laughs> Don't go too far with these ideas. That's, uh, that has been the fear of parents who had religious children for ages. And they might take these ideas too seriously. Some is good, too much is not good. But, uh, and so that was uh, uh, King Rita Dwaja, his uh, problem. So after three children who all renounced hearth and home in a state of enlightenment, perfectly free, perfectly immersed in infinite bliss, never to be uh, uh, tainted by illusion again, knowing themselves to be one with the infinite. They walked off into the infinite as it were. And so then a fourth son, the uh, 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 Madala son became pregnant a fourth time. And so the king came to her and said, I know we had an agreement. I know this was our agreement that uh, you would raise the children uh, and I would name them. And I've done that three times, but look what has happened. We can't do this for the fourth child. We're getting old now. We can't do this. Uh, uh, I will raise this child and you can give the name. Let's switch the agreement. You give the name and I will bring the child up. So Madala Saad being illumined and being herself perfectly non-attached and also being able to see the larger picture, she agreed without any argument. She said, okay. So the child was born. And then it came time for the naming ceremony. So she was asked, uh, what is the name of the child going to be? And she said, Alarka, A-L-A-R-K-A. -A -A, for those of you who can't catch Sanskrit to pronunciation, which is difficult. I find that all of the time now that I'm living in France. I have to see words spelled out before I can catch them sometimes. <laughs> so, so she gave the name Alarka to her child. And her husband was outraged and others were shocked. A gasp went out in the court when she uh, announced the name of the child. Uh, so what does Alarka mean? It means mad dog, mad dog. India is not America, it's not France. Uh, dogs are not, uh, uh, nowadays many people in India have pet dogs, but that's a new fashion. Uh, dogs in India generally were street dogs, very mangy, uh, diseased, carrying all sorts of uh, ticks and insects and things. Uh, they get uh, Because they're half wild, they get into dog fights. And so most of them have one ear falling down like my hat, like that, and one, one ear going up. Uh, torn lips from getting into fights and everything. Uh, uh, dogs are a, uh, the general street dog in India is a real mess. And so people uh, look on dogs as extremely dirty because they, they are there uh, and uh, they uh, are often mad. And so they're dangerous also. And so dogs uh, to begin with are something that are considered dirty and dangerous and something that you don't uh, uh, want to get close to. And then she names him not dog. Uh, she could have just named him dog and that would have been terrible. 
but she named the child Mad Dog. And <coughs> so her husband, Ritadwaja, he says, what in the world are you doing? Why are you naming our child Mad Dog, Alarka? And she said, it's just a name. He has no name. He's Brahman itself. He's the reality itself. Uh, and uh, so what, what, does a, what difference does a name mean? It doesn't touch him. It has nothing to do with him. A name is merely a convention. You can call it, we could call him whatever we like, but I give him the name Mad Dog, Alark. Uh, and so in the next session, um, after the uh, question and answer or meditation, uh, we'll come to the uh, hymn that she sang uh, because the first part of it is what she sang to all of them, but most of the actual lullaby of Queen Badalasa is what she sang to Alarka, who would cry every time he heard his name. Whenever he was called Mad Dog, he would start crying. And so then she would use the lullaby to teach him uh, the highest truth. So let me finish the story. And next time I'll come back to, and give the lullaby, which is very beautiful. Um, what happened to Alarka, the uh, mad dog? The king raised him. She, uh, uh, she named him. And when he was still a baby, she would, uh, because she was her, uh, its mother and she would uh, nurse it and uh, she would sing to it, but it didn't go beyond that. The king, as soon as uh, possible, took uh, the baby away from his wife, gave it to a nurse uh, for nurse feeding uh, and for bringing up as a prince. So the child was raised to be a prince, this one, the last uh, child. Uh, and uh, Queen Madalasa gave the child uh, a, a message uh, that was uh, enclosed. And she told the child, this is for you to open only when you're facing a great uh, difficulty in your life and you don't know where to turn. When you're facing a great difficulty, open this and read it, but not until then. And uh, so then the child uh, became a, a, a youth and took over the kingdom. And Queen, uh, King Ritudhwaja and Queen Madalasa, they retired to uh, the forest hermitage of Dattatreya. Dattatreya was an avadhuta, uh, well, uh, a highly regarded illumined soul uh, in Indian lore. So who knows whether it was the same uh, Dattatreya or whatever, or whether they even was a Dattatreya, that doesn't matter. The story. Uh, expresses the truth, the historical nature of it that doesn't need to concern us. So the story tells that they retired to the hermitage of King Dattatreya, who was himself a fully illumined soul of the highest uh, caliber, uh, known as an avaduta, one who has been washed free of all illusion. And there Madalasa lived in her state of illumination and her husband, the king, he practiced uh, tapasya, spiritual disciplines in order to attain to illumination. And there they finished out their life. So what happened to Alarka, the, uh, the son who became the king? He as king one day was facing uh, a great tragedy where he was about to lose his kingdom itself. It looked like there was no hope from any side. And so he re remembered his mother's message, remembered the note that she had left for him. And he said, if ever there's a time to read it, now is the time because I don't know where to turn. So he opened, opened up the message and it said, Shuddhosi buddhosi niranjanosi, samsara maya privarjitosi. You are pure, you are illumined, you are stainless, you are free from the illusion of maya. Give up this illusion of samsara, which is based in the, the uh, sleep of ignorance. And with that, he became illumined. The instruction she had given to him as a baby, singing that song to him, suddenly he remembered. Uh, and uh, he attained to illumination and he left the kingdom. And like his three previous brothers, he walked out into the world as a free soul. And so that's the story. <laughs> so now uh, I believe this is the, uh, uh, yes, this is the end of this, uh, this uh, session. So now we can have guided meditation or question and answers. Um, let me try, I like, I love question and answers, but I want to try with you a guided meditation. To do it well actually takes much longer than we have, but we can do it in the, the time that we have. I'll just do a shortened version. 
And it is a, uh, a meditation on unity. A meditation on unity. There are several meditations that are very appropriate to, to the theme that we are handling this weekend. Uh, but this one is one, a good one to start with because a meditation on unity is one that uh, anyone can do, whether you're on a devotional path or a path of knowledge or uh, whatever your path is, it's excellent for the path of action as well, karma yoga, as well as uh, psychic control or meditation. Uh, it's a meditation that I learned by listening to recorded talks of Swami Ashokananda. And uh, so I want to give him credit because it's a beautiful meditation and he just, he doesn't give, the, give it as a meditation. He just says that it is a very good meditation to meditate on unity. And so I developed it into a meditation, which I myself uh, use oftentimes and I found great benefit from it. And strangely, it turns out to be really the first meditation I ever practiced before when I just read a book on Vedanta, knew nothing about meditation except that people did it. And I would do this meditation just because it came to me. And so when I heard Swami Ashokananda speaking of it, it came back to me uh, quite naturally. So I'm just going to give a word of explanation and then I'll give you guidance in uh, doing it. It's very effective for one who doesn't believe in God, who thinks that there may be something spiritual, but they have trouble with the idea of God. Now, it, it's, the, it's perfectly compatible with belief in God also. But the beauty of it is that all of us have right now, we have always had the perception of unity. We see everywhere diversity all around us. Everything, uh, everything are particularities. We see everything separate from everything else. We see only details. We see everything that we, everything that we see. We take a simple flower, we can analyze it uh, our whole lives and never come to an end of analyzing that simple flower. Everything is diverse, everything is different, separate. But how do we see all of that diversity? How do we see it? Why is it that we see all of this diversity, but we see it as forming a cosmos, not chaos? It should be chaos when everything is infinitely divisible and everything is separate from everything. Yet we see it as a cosmos, why? Because our first perception is of unity and without unity, we could not see any diversity. All of this that we see, all of the many things that we see, it's all held together on the unitary field of our consciousness. And we don't even have to go that far for this meditation. We don't have to go that far into philosophy. All we have to do is to try to feel a unity pervading everything. And we can do it. Why? Because that is our first perception. We perceive everything on the basis of that field of unity, the unity pervading everything, whether you think of it as the unity of existence, as Swami Sarvapriyananda was speaking about in the previous session. Everything is, the book is, uh, the uh, cloth is, everything is, but what is isness, existence? Or we can approach it as consciousness, but for today, just as unity, the simple idea of unity, trying to feel a unity pervading everything. And why is that beneficial and why is it spiritual? Because it's impossible to feel a unity pervading everything without feeling that that unity is spiritual. You can't actually begin to feel the unity behind all of your experience without feeling that it is higher than the experience that you normally have, that is something holy, that is something spiritual. So let's uh, begin as we have now 15 minutes. So begin with, by taking, just to prepare the mind, begin by taking three deep breaths, breathe in deeply and slowly, and then breathe out deeply and slowly, and do that three times to calm the body and mind.
And now use the breath to send out thoughts of goodwill towards all beings everywhere. Breathe in love for all beings and breathe that love out in all directions with words such as, may all beings everywhere realize what is good. Breathe in universal love, breathe that love out, may all beings everywhere realize what is good and continue in that way. Breathe as if you were a sponge of respiration, breathing not just through the nostrils, but through every pore of your skin, breathing in love, breathing out that love in all directions. May all beings everywhere realize what is good. Now let us turn our attention to the physical body in order to bring it into a deeper state of harmony so that it serves as an instrument of concentration and not as a distraction as it so often is. Think of each part of the body starting from the toes and working up progressively part by part to the top of the head slowly so that you can do it well. And as you go from the toes to the top of the head, picture each part in the mind's eye as pure, perfect, and full of light, no matter what its actual condition might be. Picture it as pure, perfect, and full of light. And in that way, go from the toes to the top of the head and then picture the whole body at once as pure, perfect, full of light. Try to feel the body as one harmonious field or system of energy, not as a heavy solid material object, but as one harmonious field or system of energy. That is, when your eyes are closed and you're not looking at the body, you feel the body's presence, whereby you can directly feel parts of the body which you can never see with the eyes like your back or the top of your head, you feel them directly. That sensation of the body's presence when your eyes are closed is the direct experience of the body as a field or system of energy, the energy of sensation, that almost tingling feeling of the body's outline. And yet normally through memory, we superimpose on that pure sensation, the idea of the body's heaviness, materiality, etc. Try to feel it just as pure sensation, that tingling field of sensation that we've experienced directly and nothing more.
wherever you feel any special sensations, such as your feet on the floor, your hands on your lap, try to feel such points of contact as simply concentrations of sensation in the general field of sensation, which is the body. That is, don't feel them uh, with interpretation as my solid feet are resting on the solid floor or my solid hands are pressing against my solid knees. Feel it without interpretation, just as a field of energy with special points of concentration of energy, nothing more. That is, feel it as you directly feel it without interpretation. And that way you can come to a point where you feel practically weightless and floating, just a field of sensation. And notice how that sensation of the field, which is the body. It floats within your awareness. Your awareness is not side of it, not inside of it. The sensation of your body is inside of your awareness. Your awareness is the container and the body floats therein. And now we come to the heart of the meditation. Simply try to feel a sense of unity pervading all things inside and out. A field of unity in which everything that you perceive exists. Try to feel an existing unity and again, it is possible because it's the first thing that you perceive. Everything else is perceived on top of it. Just make an effort to imagine, to feel a sense of unity pervading everything inside and out. The sensation of the body, that sensation, the field of energy of sensation, which is the body when your eyes are closed, it's always that, but you feel it especially directly when the eyes are closed. That's still there. That's still floating in your awareness. You don't need to do anything about it. Let it be. But the sense of unity is unobstructed. It's inside, outside, through, in and through, pervading everything. As your awareness wanders to your surroundings without opening your eyes, wanders to your surroundings, everything is perceived on that field of unity. Just try to feel it. Thoughts arise, 
perceptions arise, you hear sounds, you feel feelings in the body, memories arise. All of that happens, comes and goes. But pervading all of it is the abiding sense of unity. Just as in a cinema, a movie is projected onto a screen. It's just images of light, colors of light projected onto a screen. All kinds of things are happening in the movie. You go from London to New York, to South Africa, to China. You ride on a roller coaster. There's a car chase. People come, people go, new actors appear, actresses appear on the screen, so many things happening, so much action. And yet it's all possible because of the stillness of the screen. The screen is that which makes the perception of diversity, which are these images of color, possible. And yet the screen does nothing, it's just there. And so with the unity pervading everything, it may not do anything, but it is reality itself. And it's not dead like a scream. It is reality itself, divine reality. So whether you think in terms of self-knowledge or God knowledge, or just existence itself or consciousness itself, it's all the same unity. Try to feel that for another few moments before we close. Om Pur Bhuvaswaha Tat Savitur Varanyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhyo Yona Prachodayat We meditate on the effulgent glory of that luminous being who has projected the worlds. May that illuminate our hearts. Om. So with that, I bring the meditation to a close and turn it back over to Mataji.